from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, The Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. Okay. Here we are. Welcome, everybody. Yeah, it's exciting day today because we're actually in the same room. Right? Which is Some efficiency. We, yeah. 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 Look at all the bandwidth we save. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> You know, I, I heard an interesting thing, uh, interesting, um, uh, and, it, and it brings up the concept of, of a nature of critique. You know, I'm a big climate change guy. I don't know how I weave it into almost everything I say, but when 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 somebody's talking about, about climate change and they, they were, um, you know, imagining a new future, right, where we're, I guess, more connected, we're more on computers, maybe less mm -hmm. like menial kind of job sort of scenario. What is this uh, criticism that I hear about using electricity and super centers and the, uh, you know, the, the incredible gluttonous amount of electricity that's drawn down on our electrical grids because we're doing something similar to this, right? Like, mm -hmm. does, does that resonate oh, with you guys no, at all, it. right? In like a, a post-carbon -car world? I think you know, that just demonstrates is that there's no easy answer, right? Mm. So, you know, if you're, let's say, anti-oil or anti-pipeline, that's great, but there's always more to it, right? Or if you're, you know, mm. pro this type of power or that type of power or whatever, like it's it's never as simple as what's directly in front of your face. Yeah, yeah I don't know. I, for me, it's not necessarily like yeah. In my life, I have three things plugged in and running in the background that I could probably address, right? That pulls power from the grid that ne probably doesn't need to, but it's convenient to leave it plugged in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Convenience is a great motivator. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't know, like, do we say that it's we're switching from one evil to another? I don't know. There's still a lot of room for improvement in the little things in between, I think. Yeah. Well, Adam, you do. Um, well, actually, you guys are both engineers, right? Does this that's the idea, right? So, I mean, there's a foundation of you guys thinking empirically for pretty much most of what you do. Right. I mean, it, it, it buttresses your, your understanding of the world. Would that be correct? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I would say. So, sorry, I was just going to say you can take. Subjective things like, um, I don't know, human behavior and interaction. And, you know, you can try and build frameworks around it or do some analysis on it or speak intelligently on it. I, I feel as though our engineering background has helped us, at, at the very least, the language to be able to describe such things in an intelligent yeah. way. Well, I mean, this, this, this episode is all about science fiction, so we'll... Uh, you know, we'll we'll merge the two worlds sooner than later. Be, anybody that wants to learn more about uh, Adam and Kate's uh, engineering background and how you apply it in a in a day to day environment, that's that's the uh, the the Monday series. Today we're here to talk about that's science right. fiction, and in particular mm -hmm. this merger between uh, technology, science, and the the creations that we imagine, and so. Kate was very um, inspirational in, in creating the following clip, and she's covering her face like it's. But it's it's an interesting thing that happens here. Um, uh, we we were playing the video uh, back, and I know what is this phenomenon that when we see the iteration of our own creation coming back on us, it makes us. It does it. It does it to me as well, right? I mean, it it, it somehow changes. Uh, it, it, it changes the experience knowing that we've created that, right? Yeah, totally. Big time. It's like a piece of yourself out there for judgment of all. Right? And, yeah. And, and then you're the hardest critic of yeah. yourself. <laughs> but like this, this was challenging. We, so yeah. for the people watching, it's like 
Daniel puts together a series of video clips and then we voice them over. But it's almost like verse engineering the story he's telling himself when he puts together these video clips and trying to create what we think the story is there. And so for me, it was, it was challenging, but uh, here it is. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll play it and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can get some feedback here from everybody. <laughs> Imagine a world where we have embraced scientific technology to bioengineer humans. Growing beings with amplified traits to serve the greater needs. Would we exploit our manufactured siblings, treating them as slaves? When the lines of science and creation are blurred, will we maintain our humanity? In a world where the slightest shift could destroy civilization as we know it, do we decide to remove our self-imposed ethical limitations upon our scientific world, all in the name of our own survival? And if we go down this rabbit hole of creation, manipulating our DNA, merging biotechnology into our bodies to be stronger, faster, smarter, would we recognize the creatures we have become? For science and technology is no longer our limitation. We have the ability to create and manipulate life. But just because we can do it, the question is, should we? Our biggest limitation to bringing creatures to life is the controversy of ethics. Will this barrier be enough to set us on the right course to ensure we truly act in humanity's best interest? Or will we push past those limitations in a blind race to save ourselves from our fragile existence? telling ourselves it'll be for our own good. Could we truly create a better, stronger version of ourselves? Or will we suffer the fate of Dr. Frankenstein, doomed to a life of misery and fueled by only that to drive down and destroy our creations? A creation that was misunderstood, mistreated and shunned from the only thing he ever sought human connection. Can we be better than Dr. Frankenstein? Do we have the empathy strong enough to nurture what we build? Do you think we're ready for this future? There we go. Who's bugged? It was pretty good. That was amazing. <laughs> it's <was> really hard. <laughs> it is. It's really hard, and it's a technique that it's um, it's it's an FFA, which you know could mean a free for all, but it's a free form association. Okay. Right? So, I thought the extra percent melts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the idea, and we use we use this in the in on the plank sip site a lot. Where as you you we're, we give our um, our writers a quote, and we urge them not to look it up, not to consult the Google Oracle. We're actually trying mm -hmm. to get them to think just with the the thoughts that are dropping in front of their consciousness, right? So, um, despite the fact that you might have thought that I had uh, a sequence or a narrative in mind, in fact, all I really was doing was trying to have a starting point similar to the genre of science fiction that you know that that emerges from academia that says that the the genre uh, more most likely started with Mary Shelley, right? And so when you look at the creative or think or try and inhabit this mind to feel what it's like to be Mary Shelley in that particular point in time, she was just completely wide open to, um, uh, a, a completely new world, right? Um, mm -hmm. We would do a little bit of study about her and some of the the, the corresponding um, uh, influences in her life at that particular period of time. But I mean, you know, I think this is is really um, an interesting starting point, uh, to, you know, to our journey on, uh, on on the creation of a science fiction story. 
Yeah. I loved, you know, all the what ifs, you know, all, all these questions like, are we ready, you know, or are we doomed and all this. And <laughs> to me, that's what great sci-fi answers, right? Or at least it poses a, a hypothetical and then we can imagine that future and say, yeah, okay, that's amazing. Or, or no, or oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go down that rabbit hole. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's really interesting. Like, you're right. Um, Mary Shelley was kind of like a trailblazer in her own right, starting a whole new, a whole new genre and one that, that is translated way past her time over and over and over again. And it's kind of like, I don't think there's a lot of business lesson sci-fi books out there. And so maybe we are, blazing our own little trail here maybe well yeah. and sci-fi has an interesting history right like even star trek which is you know worldwide phenomenon now at the time you know like it, it was kind of controversial to put that on tv if you're like why like rolling their eyes at it this is stupid right uh yeah here we are captured the imaginations the heart know, the, the what <laughs> if right um and i think that's 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 what I lo lo love about sci-fi or, or fantasy. You can imagine yourself in this other world where this, maybe the stakes aren't as personal or as high, right? Um, so, yeah, well done, Caitlin. Good job. Yeah, I'll I agree. That was very, very good, yeah. Um, I honestly have to consult the Google Oracle, though, just to, like, some of the references I was new to, right? What, what time did you in the morning did you film that at? At 4 a.m. I um, voiced that. Over. That's how I got that nice, luxurious, just woke up sound that you heard throughout the. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Wow. Well, I have to say that in this particular case, I actually want you guys to consult the Google Oracle, and the and the reason is is that um, the the theme throughout this one this particular assignment and all the rest that follow for, I think, you know, 12 or 16 weeks is um, very educational. So it will be read it, read, <clears throat> read and try and summarize and try and understand what these references are. Wikipedia is a great source. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I'm not asking to do uh, to become an expert on it, but I think that um, this will only enrich your experience. Uh, with mm -hmm. writing the pieces, right? And mm -hmm. I would say enjoy the process. Try and come up with ideas and, um, from Wikipedia uh, as to how they're actually structuring the book. Um, and I know a lot of classics, what they do is that you can build scenes that are almost a pastiche, uh, a, a, an allusion towards something else that came before in the genre, right? Mm -hmm. So. Like, for example, if we were to uh, build a scene, um, you know, that resembled another uh, uh, another story, the genre would probably pick up on that if we did that correctly. And mm -hmm. then we have this ability to have um, kind of a uh, uh, like like a, a conversation uh, critique. We're able to voice it through the the storytelling mechanism, which is is really interesting. And. Um, if there's something opinionated, like for example, Adam, that you feel passionate about with, you know, something that's influenced you there, you, you can set the stage. You guys are literally the people that are, you know, orchestrating that performance. And so, mm -hmm. you know, really try and think about how, you know, how to develop that and, and what kind of scenes you want to create. You know, and I think this was kind of the idea about, you know, doing this live and inviting people to add their two cents in. You know, it kind of appeals to the engineer in me, right? Because I want to create a world that um, at least sounds a little bit plausible, right? Because I have something serious to say. And, um, yeah, if we can add a little bit of, you know, actual intelligent theory into it, and then, like you said, pull from Blade Runner or whatever, then uh, let's do that, right? Um, people have debated, you know, the final scene in Blade Runner for ages. People probably still fight about that right so um but yeah like i would love to create something with a kind of nod at those those types of classics right well a space odyssey for example it has a controversial ending as well and um 
you know, from that standpoint, are you guys visu visualizing anything from an ending already? Like some people come up with the ideas and reverse engineer it. I mean, I'm not asking to divulge it, but you know, there is there is there something, or you don't know how the novel will end. What what's Honestly, what is your? No, not I right now. I we imagined the beginning, and I think last time we talked about that whole thing with the sunrise, and like that's kind of what we imagined. Uh, we kind of imagined a bit of the journey. But as far as an ending, no, I haven't, haven't got that far. Like I, I and I totally, I've, I've, I've heard interviews with writers and directors and all that where they're just like, I knew the ending from the start. It was this, right? But I no, don't, I don't know if I see that. I'm kind of excited to see where this goes. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so to stay on task, um, we have to somehow little volley that back and forth i think i i volunteered to do um you know some sort of an initial uh a sketch on on the uh, um on the piece so um even a note form sort of concept just you know send me a note mm -hmm. sort of bullet point sort of highlights and then i'll kind of try and stitch it together in a um in a, in a, a show not tell kind of scenario right so yeah. do that and then i'll see if of. i can Excellent. Yeah, we'll share the file with you and then you can kind of switch our mode because we we're in that uh, telling mode, right? And so we need to kind of get into the form of, of like taking the, the reader on a journey instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't, I mean, in terms of us kind of sketching this out to begin with, let me propose something here. Okay. If we continue with the engineers on the on the uh, on the tell mode, right? Yeah. Then we this is I think that's really important because it 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 allows you to bullet point through the progression of the novel, right? And then yeah. what we can always do is go back and then, but this this provides something that um, it gives the 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 thematic and the logic logical consistency through the novel, it gives something that's um, really important because inconsistency and, and law, it has a logical flow. Right. And so I mm -hmm. would say, um, you know, don't get lost in the floweriness of it. Right. I, you know, I can start by putting a few things in front of you guys in terms of, you know, showing right. And describing. Um, and so let's continue with the, um, the showing part of it. Let's see if yeah. we can kind of structure the whole novel that way. Um, okay, and yeah, I think that's great, right? Like even if, you know, we draw some notes down and circle them and be like, need some kind of story here to illustrate this point. But this is the point that we're trying to say, right? Um, exactly. Yeah. It becomes more of a collaborative kind of like, you know, I have to imagine writing something on this scale. I've never done it, but, um, it's not like you just sit down and start typing and you get everything, right? You kind of edit it and edit it and edit it and edit it and edit it, right? Um, so, yeah, I've, I'm game for that. I think that sounds awesome. And it's a learning process for us, too. We're going to learn a little bit about writing. and. Um, yeah, all of our writing has been fairly technical up to this point. <laughs> yeah, right? So, so we got to, like, unlearn that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Well, exactly. but that's what I'm trying to do is keep you guys in that mode to technically run it through with structure. And then you guys understand all the points that it's moving towards. And so you won't get in kind of a rookie move lost in a direction that you feel you have to, you know, pull back from. Right. Yeah. Um, no, and and you, yeah. you're swimming upstream. Right. And then it's hard and it loses yeah. the audience. So I don't have the vision. So I don't have the structure, but I can. Mm you know, light, start to fill some of the material, right? And then it's more well, intuitive to say, did you capture that? And, yeah, you know, you keep telling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the very first day what we did is we took a whole bunch of sticky notes and, like, wrote all these ideas of what we kind of wanted to represent. And then we're like, okay, so where's the story around all of these things? And where's the epiphany? And where does this happen? And where does this character go on a journey? When does he or she transform, right? When did, mm. when did they go on that? What's the obstacle? So we kind of mapped it all out. We put all these sticky notes on and then move them around until we figured out the right sort of path and that, okay, this character enters in here and this is what the they bring to the table, right? So we mapped it kind of all out like that. And then we realized that in order for us to 
put this into a sci-fi world, we'd have to imagine a whole world. So then we had a whole brainstorming, brainstorming <laughs> session on what that world would look like. Yeah. And like even philosophize what the house would look like. And then we had to build a timeline. So we have a timeline all sticky noted out of what happens, you know, from today to 600 years in the future. Right. And it's just like random thoughts that we had, like, Oh, by this date, we won't have this anymore. And by this date, this has changed. And how did we evolve to get to this standpoint? So it's kind of like a whole bunch of scattered sticky notes right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, you know, what I learned about this creative process is, you know, we, we cleared the whole day. We we're like, all right, we're just gonna do this for like eight hours. It'd be great. And after two hours, we're exhausted. We're just like, hey, no, you're <laughs> you know, we kind of like learned we, that there's a, you only have so much to give. And then you kind of have to just give your nod to the creativity gods and say, okay, we'll do something else now. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's it's actually uh, you know much more difficult than people would imagine, uh, you know, to do that. And I I think that um, I don't know if this is for everybody, but it kind of takes a piece of your soul every time you produce something, right? Sure. And uh, it 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 just um, at least the good stuff. It just it it you know it rips down to. Uh, you know something really really fundamental and it it's uh it's uh it's a litmus for personal growth i think and what's uh really beautiful about it is that if um if people appreciate that and uh you you give something to a community that that uh is is uh receptive it, it's probably a, 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 a quite an amazing feeling and so um We've got our work cut out for us, right? Yeah, right. Well, I hope, you know, at the end of the day, you know, like that voiceover Caitlin did, if you, if whatever we produce, you read it and it makes you think and makes you have a conversation and then makes someone else think about something a little differently and then maybe argue about it or whatever, like, you know, let's put in some controversial ideas in there and see what people pull from it. Like, that's, that's what I kind of imagine is a success, right? So Yeah. So let's 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 think about this. I know it's more of a Moore's projection on 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 technological advance, but if we go back 600 years from uh, from today, um, you know we're stuck really in the uh, in the Middle Ages, right? So, yeah. um, I don't know. Let's just have some fun with this. I mean, I I, I quite often think about um, our ability to suffer right um as compared to to let's say a, a daniel kate and adam version of us that was in 1472 right mm-hmm. i mean you know childbirth for example or uh, uh, an operation or a kidney stone or <laughs> like it just horrific suffering well, and I, pain. You- You know, I blew my Achilles last year and I often think about like how lucky I am that I live in a time where that can be fixed. It's like, I'm like, Jesus, 200 years ago, I would either have been hobbled for life or killed. Like, that was it. (laughs) Like a horse. Yeah. Taking out to pasture. (laughs) You know, so um, that, that sounds horrifying. So yeah, when we project into the future, and I think this, this is one of the difficulties about it is when we project the future, we can't help but draw a straight line, right? Yeah. Like a linear progression. But we know, even if it doesn't matter how many times we're told, that it's an exponential, right? And especially now with computers and, you know, all all this stuff. So even then, you can't, you know, you still, you can't force yourself to think exponentially. (laughs) It's, it's, It's so hard, right? Well, it's so funny to watch, like, films that have been that project where the future is actually like Mm -hmm. if you look at uh back to the future number two yeah right like it's amazing how much they projected and how much actually came true and what did and what kind of happened in that time but it's like this anything's possible kind of realm but i love that kind of stuff where you say you know when, when when did they go back to the future 2013 2015 2015 right and it's past but like i mean holographic videos and 3d imagery yeah we're there right and i remember watching at the time the big shark coming out 
Mm-hmm. Right? Jaws 14 or something. <laughs> yeah. <like that. laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, yeah, we did that. We were there. We made that. Um, shrinkable clothing I think didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh yeah it's this art of the possible it's kind of really cool and allows us to just you know tell us we're wrong everybody who's going to read the book this year won't be around to tell us if we're right or wrong wait wait a minute I, I have to comment on this shrinkable clothing thing um my wife okay. found something and i you know she was very proud to show me the the um the closet right and so I looked at the, she says, don't you notice anything? And I'm like, oh man, I'm walking to something here, right? I'm in the closet, which is not my zone really, right? <laughs> and so I'm trying to work at the closet, trying to think. Uh, I was coming up blank. Well, apparently what she bought was this like suction thing that takes my winter jackets and stuff that I'm not going to be using in the next six months and the condenses it down. Yeah, the vacuum thing, right? It sucks it just down mm-hmm. to like nothing. And so we got like half of our closet space back. It's amazing. Okay. There you go. I mean, you know, just weird things that, you know, I mean, you, you, you could you could look at this in the 80s or something and say, yeah, we're going to have this in 2020. And be like, what? You know, like, yeah, you just hook it up to this, like, bladder of, like, petroleum and you're going to, <laughs> you know, right? Like, <laughs> but we, but we, become, we thing, become used to it. Like we become, so it's like, oh, it's not a big thing. Novelty yeah. now is something to discover and it's, but then once we, um, once we become accustomed to it, it's, it's no longer, it, it's a norm, right? Well, and I think, you know, one thing, one of my favorite sci-fi novels and I, I'll, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, but it was about, you know, it's the kind of future, X hundred years in the future, space travel, and there's eight people on a space station that's traveling, and then some kind of disaster occurs, and they have the capability and the skills and all the materials they need to save themselves, but because of the individual flaws of the people, it's about how you know, this person doesn't like that person, so doesn't talk to them. And then that person goes and steals this from this person. And they all start acting individually and selfishly. And one by one, they all die. And it sounds terribly tragic, but the, 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 the Nala was so powerfully done because they came this close to succeeding. All they had to do was work together. But because of their own flawed characters, uh, they, they doomed themselves. And I just thought that was kind of cool. Um, exercise or thought experiment in the human condition because yeah, it took place in space and there was some fantastical stuff, but at the end of the day, it was about people just being people. And, um, you know, that's what I, I, I really think is what we want to try and create here, right? Is people just being people with some cool kind of imagining scenarios around it. Right? Um, yeah, it sounds kind of do, you, do you guys feel like, you know, what comes up comes to my mind is that you guys, you guys kind of embody that in, in the, you know, in the Enta philosophy. Like, I don't know, I'm not trying to pull it back to Enta here at all, but the idea is, is that you've got um, some chaos, you've got some entropy going on with organizations and they could be, if, if they had that crystal ball, they could be so close to exceptionality, mm-hmm. like so close. It's like, what is revealing? What, what is that simple little, Get, you know, recipe that could just get you right onto track, you know? That's a, it's a really good point. Right. And he, you know, look at, look at what's going on today in the world, right? Like, are we, are we doing pretty good? Are we doing great? Like, did we do it close to doing great? Like, you know, and, and how many people are out there that just with a little push could be great. Right. Um, so you know, Where they say good is the biggest enemy of being great. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, we started imagining in our scenario, we imagined a character that um, is not great, pretty good, right? But then due to some external influences, he's like pushed into a circumstance where he has to become great. Um, so, and I think that, you know, good to great is far more inspirational than like meh to good, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, 
<laughs> yeah, that's kind of what we kind but of. But greatness is an interesting thing that okay, and I I have to you know there's there's been a few people that have adopted that particular you know, Frederick and Alexander, mm-hmm. right? I mean, mm-hmm. the people that follow that go, holy shit, yeah, I want I want a piece of Alexander's you know, empire, so to speak, mm-hmm. right? Because he's the great, you know? Um, and he almost achieved like quite possibly godlike status, right? With the Hellenization of, of, of um, the world, at least the Western world anyways. Well, Western and Eastern as well, I guess, influenced. But the idea is, is that, is it, is it now, is it a perversion to think that everybody can be great? Not, not to say it's one on, on someone's ability, but there's got to be like um, the right balance of precursors. There has to be the right balance of environmental stimuli. There has to be a whole host of recipes that contribute to something that is quite honestly outside of somebody's you know willful ability to be truly historically great, right? So the, maybe I'm trying to draw a distinction between historically great, um, you know, or or just like lifetime greatness like really really revered by you know by friends and and family right like what what is greatness well and i think that's a really interesting point because we talk about you talk about historically great and where you're having an impact on many generations to come right like mary shelley great example like historically great like she to, there's not a kid today who doesn't know who Frankenstein is, although they probably have it wrong. It's the doctor, not the actual monster, but, but there's it's not, yeah, it's a trick question. There's not a kid today who doesn't know that name. Right. And so like that is like, it just translates through generations um, being historically great. But w- when we talk about individually great, we talk about finding, f- finding, and we just actually had a conversation about this. It's your ikigai, like the Japanese philosophy of understanding what your real purpose is and living in your greatest potential point, right? And and being able to literally be happy. And I think that's kind of the concept that we want to plug in here is that this journey, our character goes on this journey and he actually finds that connecting with people, you know, is a, a way for him to reach his EK guy and where he unlocks his potential. And that, you know, if people haven't found what they're passionate about, uh, they kind of go through the motions. And I think this is actually, I mean, it happens today. There's so many people who are not really plugged into their potential and they kind of just, they work because they gotta, you know, and they get maybe 60 to top 70% of the productivity that they could actually be giving so companies miss out, people miss out, everybody's kind of just putting in the motions um, versus finding what they're, what they're meant to do and living it, right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, this is a journey for Adam and I, like when we started and uh, we, like it was this whole epiphany of like, we get to do this, right? Could you imagine having a company where everybody's plugged in like that? And I think this is the, the concept of where our character goes on this big epiphany, this journey, and then realizes that there's all this potential that they're not even tapping into, right? Mm -hmm. And he starts to unlock it. Yeah, Yeah, I I would say that the, you know, know, one of the indicators of you guys really, really um, taking action or embodying that that feeling is, is this exact episode and this series, in fact, is that as, as consultants, that's not the limit to what, what you guys are, your, your business partners. And I can see you're very close friends, but you're creating something creative together. And, and that's, uh, that's, that's wonderful. Right. And so, um, you know, you're, you know, because you didn't have to go down that path to create a consultancy, right? You didn't have to do that. You didn't have to merge that into, into your, uh, your personal narrative, you know, as, as many people don't, they delineate it and they separate it and they compartmentalize it. And, and quite often it actually gets pushed off to, well, I'll do that someday, right? <laughs> I'll write a book someday. 
or write a book mm. someday. Yeah, why not today? Right? Do you know? Did you? I don't know if we ever told you what actually pushed us to do this. Did we oh, ever tell no. you that? No. We did a uh, an exercise with Insight Performance uh, with the owner there, Stan Peak, he's an amazing business coach. Um, and he said, do a eulogy exercise. Okay. And so we had to do a eulogy exercise uh, about if we were to write our own eulogies today, and if we were going to write them like 20, 50, 40 years in the future, right? Your future eulogy. And so we each wrote two eulogies for ourselves, one today and one in the future. And then we read each other's eulogies. Yeah, actually, we can put a link to the episode where we did that. Uh, we mm-hmm. actually filmed it. Um, but in Adam's future eulogy, he had written a significant amount of books, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like a significant amount of books. I think there was like 50. Was it? Wow. It was a lot. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> the engineer and me said to him after the episode, I said, I just want to like reverse engineer this. So we have to start this year. <laughs> and he's like, oh yeah, I really didn't do the math on that mm-hmm. one. Uh, but I said, I promise you, we will start this year. And that was it. We found you and here we are. Well, I, I love the point of there of making the point you know, to to engineers and anybody out there, that there is an infinite difference between a zero and a one, and so it's uh, right. You know, and it's so, it seems so easy, especially if we're confronting infinity not in some abstract form. We're like, actually, I just have to start with hello world. I mean, well, and I think oh, when you're tackling a project this big, right? It, it kind of like you just got to start. You know, I can kind of plan it and think about it for years without like kind of, you know, feeling like you've got the perfect plan and then, and then executing it and starting with an incomplete vision like that or whatever is scary. Right. So it was super awesome that we started and then, you know, the universe abides, right? Like three weeks later we meet you, Dan, and you're like, Hey, you want to like do a podcast on this? Like, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. yes, we need help. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we're smart enough to know when we're not smart enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, let's see, um, see what we can come up with here. Um, so we kind of have, we've got like the kind of the, this intro, this idea of like waking up, right. And, and um, kind of the real sunrise versus the simulated one. And what would it be like if you'd never actually seen the sunrise, right. Um, kind of contrasting these, uh, these ideas. And um, yeah, I'm kind of curious to see, we, if we do what you suggest, Dan, we kind of draw some notes and then um, you can help us move that forward. Like, what? Yeah, there, there must have statements. I must have this. It must be an artificial sunrise, right? Because yeah. I actually, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And you'll be surprised what's not in my head that's in your head, right? So right. think of that right. when you write the notes. Must have this. Must be artificial. Right. Um, you know, it, it is absolutely right? Absolutes and must-haves. It's 600 years in the future, right? Just what are those bullet points of this, 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 and this, and then I'll abstract it together. And what will happen is that the role from a creative process is uh, a little bit of a three-way situation, but you have your... (laughs) Kate... She's Caitlin. It's not that kind of podcast. <laughs> I love it that it came from Kate and not from Adam or myself, right? <laughs> okay. All right. I gotta do I have to say, I used to have Playboys in my apartment. Okay. Right? Okay. These kind of things, right? You know, you know what? The dudes that used to come over never picked the bloody thing up, but the girls always looked at the thing. Always like <laughs> <laughs> it was just a weird sort of thing, right? Anyways, okay, we can move on from that. Unless you, you guys have never know what you can see girls' nights, but <laughs> let me tell you, you wish you did. <laughs> see now, and that's the, also the cognitive fall off. Is I I can multitask, but as soon as that kind of thinking comes into my head, it's like I, I, I'm at I'm at a starting point of zero again, right? Like, <laughs> Sorry, guys, we have to end the episode and <laughs> stuff. Yeah, we're just like that's it. <laughs> well, you know, and I think this this would actually maybe we can work that in, right? We've got a character, right? That's going to be making some decisions, some good ones, some bad ones. But sometimes when you have an external influence such as such as this, 
people make poor decisions <laughs> and they do them quite happily and quite readily, right? So, uh, you know, maybe there's a place we can play there a little bit. With, um, oh, you know. absolutely. You know, sex sells. So here's the thing. What does intimacy yeah. look like in this world 600 years from now, right? We haven't had that conversation. No. But that should totally be an episode. Let's pull on a sex therapist. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great idea, right? I mean, okay. So for what you guys were doing with scaffolding concepts, right? You're scaffolding certain things. And I think there should be an outreach of, you know, we've got an architect possibly that might want to come on and talk about, uh, you know, some of the buildings of the future. Um, you might even sketch it out as we're talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So we, we have that coming on. Then there's, there's um, relationships. So there's a lot of people that we can ask just, I, it's such a fun project, you know, like mm -hmm. how do you envision the future? We want an expert to come on and, and, you know, talk about, you know, what they love to create and what they love to abstract. What would yeah. the, you know, their lives and their profession be like in the future? I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Let's do it. If you want on, tell us your profession in the comments below yeah. and what, what you want to contribute. We'll have you on and you can help help build this amazing story. Do a voiceover if you want. <laughs> yeah, we'll get you to do a voiceover. It's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, the free form associative technique is a really, a really interesting one. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna keep building on it. It's Adam's turn next. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll just let you know. It's not a technological, you know, query or any kind of science thing. It's actually having you look back at at at, at, at some important um, uh, science fiction writers from our past, right? So yeah, feel free to Google amazing. Oracle it and Wikipedia it. And uh, if you're really in doubt, I need to think deeper about things. It like it was a great experience. As ho like I literally spent well like a few days contemplating the connection between the images and what it meant and what like what I could pull from that and then how to relate them all and and to tell a story and connect them all and it really made me think outside of the box. I spent a good hour in the hot tub uh, <laughs> with my coffee in the morning, just like how does this. How does this connect? What what does this mean? Looking at the sunrise come up, it was actually very beautiful. So, uh, but um, yeah, it was there. Was, it took days to put just that two minutes. It was two minutes together. I, I love how you just switched that because yeah, I had this. The, the tone of the voice was like there's this hardship and struggle, and then I'm in the hot tub. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, who are you? It's one of my favorite places to be. <laughs> it's I just love. <laughs> but I will, I will say this, Dan. I mean, we're only on episode three, and uh, already, uh, you know, you're doing such a great job pushing us out of our comfort zone, right? Thank you. Like you're gonna show, show up here, like, oh my God, what's Dan gonna make us do today? <laughs> yeah. Well, That's well, awesome. it's the the lob is back to me as well. So you, I mean, you should have something fairly straightforward. You're getting the concept of the free form association, mm -hmm. and and you know, send me those bullet points of must haves and absolutes. And I'll start to, and remember when we, when we start to exchange this, it's allowing us to kind of step through the novel. It doesn't have to be rewritten at that point. It may even never follow that narrative thread, but what we're trying to do is put all that structure in place and then we can go back and we can rewrite sections or introduce a new character or some dramatic, uh, you know, conflict or whatever. Right. But let's, let's bring it, uh, yeah, you know, let's keep progressing it this way. Love it. Thank you so much. We'll see All right. You next time. I, I think that's perfect. That's uh, bye for now and uh, top of the hour. So thanks guys. And until next week and everybody out there, uh, you know, keep thinking and stay creative. Thank you.